next song is number 517, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. for our theme song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. You'll find it in your program.
Well, good evening, GYC Northwest. Is this, this working? Okay. Um, well, as many of you know, um, over the last year, um, Northwest Youth Conference transitioned um, to becoming a full GYC affiliate, GYC Northwest. And as a result, um, much of the preparation for this current conference was made by the Northwest Youth Conference Committee. And so what we've done tonight is we've asked both the Northwest Youth Conference Committee and the GYC Northwest Committee, both combined committees, uh, to come together here this evening and to share with you a little bit about the theme for this year's conference, why we chose it, and why we believe it's important. I'd like to invite you all, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to John. John chapter 17. Starting in verse 1. John chapter 17, starting in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes unto heaven, to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to, many, to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And I'd like to draw your attention to verse 2. It speaks of Christ having power over all flesh. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, there's a precious promise that I have loved to claim. And it says that he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So Christ has the power over all flesh, and the Father has given to him to give eternal life to as many as God has given to him. And eternal life, we are told, is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I would like you to turn now to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And it says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So we see that to know God, to have eternal life is to know God, and we know that we know God if we keep his commandments. And I didn't realize that this quote was going to be shared earlier, but I'll share it again. Gospel Workers, page 161. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. And I think that's pretty powerful. That's why I believe that this
what we were supposed to talk about. The other things just kind of went away. And when we went to make our vote, our decision, it was absolutely, absolutely unanimous. And so we felt that that was a clear leading that God was wanting us to talk about these things. Absolutely. Um, I can testify that God was leading, at least from what I saw. Um, when we were there in the early um, get-togethers of our committee, talking about what our theme should be. I can't even remember anything else that was thrown out there. So that's kind of shows how this really did take over. Um, and to me, there's at least two witnesses that I have that God is in this. Um, and there's many more witnesses, but that God is in these meetings. One is the message. Um, because this is a, the Laodicean message. It's the one that, you know, like others have shared, the simple truth that sets the soul free, knowing that there's nothing good in us, um, recognizing that, but also <clears throat> being freed with the thought that Christ not only wants to pardon us, but he wants to dwell within us. And yeah, we have that privilege um, by faith to, to receive that. And, and he just wants so desperately for us to have that, that righteousness, that power, his love. So the message itself, and then also just how those um, meetings took place when we were discussing our theme, I, it was hard for me to remember all the details, but I know it was just very unanimous. Um, it just flowed. There was no opposition. There was no... Um, controversy, there was no disagreements, it was just perfect harmony, and it, yeah, I believe God was in it, and for me personally, convictions I had on my heart about this importance of this theme, which um, is so important, are the thoughts that um, Christ always uses past history to illustrate what's going to be happening to us at the end of the world. And we need to understand his leading, how he deals with us, and how he's taught us in the past to be prepared and to, um, by studying those, his message in the past and looking at the experience um, that he's had with his people throughout sacred history and how their lives have been changed, all that, I believe, will uh, help us to um, know Jesus and have him in us. So when I think about righteousness by faith, when I think about justification by faith, you know, and as from, from things I had been studying, reading, and hearing over the last six months or so, in fact, one of the things that comes most prominently to mind is actually the story of creation. See, when, when God created man in the Garden of Eden, we read in the book of Genesis that he formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and it was then that man became a living soul. And one thing you notice there is that Adam was, when God created Adam, Adam was constructed of materials in which there was no, there was no inherent value or worth. And so it, it was the breath of God, it was the power of God, it was the presence of God that gave value to the dust from which Adam had been formed. And from what I have seen, this was to serve as an object lesson to humanity. Not, it was designed not just to, to illustrate the worthlessness of man in his own strength and in his own power, but also to demonstrate the power of God in being able to bring out, to, to bring to light the, the image of God from that dust. And it was God's purpose um, throughout, his, throughout the ages since to, to teach his people that in their own strength and in their own, in, a, in their own righteousness, they were worthless, powerless, and frankly hopeless. But he also likewise sought to teach his people that through the, the, the power of the gospel resides ultimately in its ability to take 
that which is hopeless, that which is powerless, that which is worthless, and to, and to transform it into the very image of God. And when you look throughout, when you, when you, when you look through history, through the patriarchs, through the prophets, through the kings, when you look through Israel's captivity and restoration, when you examine the life of Christ and the, you know, the history of the apostles in the early church, you see time and time again that it has been God's continual purpose to teach his people to lose all confidence in self and to depend and trust fully and completely on him. And, and as we will see more fully throughout this weekend, in these last days, God has also sought to teach us that same lesson. And as we will learn, in 1888, God sent what was described as a most precious message to his people through Elders Jones and Wagoner. And when Ellen White speaks about the message of justification by faith, she says, when she speaks about its purpose, uh, she says that she, she, she speaks of it as being, and I'm, I'm quoting here from The Faith I Live By, page 111, she says, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is, in, that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. However, at that time, the leaders of God's people, by and large, rejected that message. Instead, they chose to, to cling to their pride, to their self-sufficiency, to their, their sense of self-dependence, not recognizing that in the absence of Christ, all their good works and attempts at holiness were simply filthy rags and devoid of any saving power. And it is in light of this history and for this purpose that ultimately that we are gathered here this weekend. Because as we explore and as we reflect on the history of those who have come before us, as we, as we consider and as we reflect on what might have been and what can still be, each and every one of us is ultimately responsible for making a choice. And we, each of us has to ask ourselves, are we going to follow in the same path as those leaders back in 1888? Are we going to make the same mistakes as they did? Or are we going to choose a different path? Are we going to learn from their mistakes and ultimately surrender all to Christ? And that is the question that I believe each and every one of us is here to ask and to answer for ourselves. And you know, uh, my great-great-grandfather attended that general conference in 1888, and, and his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren grew up as Seventh-day Adventists. And so for myself, growing up in a Seventh-day Adventist home, you hear, and the home that I grew up in, I, I was surrounded by hearing of righteousness by faith and, and understanding a little bit of our history as I, as I grew up. But it, it comes, and I praise God for that. And I encourage you that our parents raise your children and instill in them a love for the Lord. But there has to come a point where the faith of your fathers has to become your own. You have to make it, not any, it's not anymore, oh, this is just my, what my parents taught me. This is what my parents believe. No, it has to become, this is what I believe. This is who I am. This is the experience that I have had. And the, the journey that the Lord has taken me on in that direction um, began, well, I don't know exactly when it began, but where I could see where it began was when I was 17 years old, I went down for a summer youth program in Texas called ASI Youth for Jesus. Many of you are probably familiar with that. And at, the, at that time in my life, um, I, was, I hadn't left the church. I was still a good Seventh-day Adventist kid. But inside, I was empty. But nobody could tell because you come to church, you put on a smile, and you look fine. But at times I would have fears of what ha what, what's going to happen? Am I lost? 
And as I went to that, that program there, in the summer I began to study the Bible together with the other students, and I began to anew study the Bible for myself. And I began to, to learn how to do evangelism. And it was at the end of that summer, it was the last meeting of the evangelistic series there, and uh, I don't remember exactly what all was talked about, but I do remember the, the topic was on heaven. And it was during that presentation that I came to understand what it means for Christ to be my personal savior. It was like I realized that Christ had left all that glory in heaven, all of the goodness up there, and had come down to this dark world, not to just simply save a world, but to save me. And it was like he had done all that he had done and gone through all that he had gone through for me and that he loved me. And since that point, it has been my desire to understand how the Bible portrays such a savior and to share it with others because I know the impact that it had in my own life. And I don't understand it all. I don't know all the answers. I'm still learning. But I do know one thing, and that is, if we get to heaven and we have all of our goodness, all of our righteousness, all the good things that we have done, and all the bad things that we have avoided doing, that's going to be completely worthless. It's not sufficient at all. But I can tell you that if we get to heaven and, and we have absolutely nothing, but if we have the Lord Jesus Christ, we have everything. Because he is the all-sufficient Savior. He can save from sin, and if you will let him, he will change you, and he will transform you. And this I know for a fact, because that's what he has done and is doing for me. There is going to be a company there that day, a great multitude that no man can number, all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, and they will come up to enter in. And if anyone should ask them, what have you done that you should enter here? What claim have you here? The answer would be, oh, I have done nothing, nothing at all to deserve it. I am a sinner dependent only on the grace of the Lord. Oh, I was so wretched, so completely a captive, and in such a bondage that nobody could deliver me but the Lord himself. So miserable that all I could do was to have the Lord constantly to comfort me. So poor that I had constantly to beg from the Lord. So blind that no one but the Lord could cause me to see. So naked that no one could clothe me with the Lord himself. All the claim that I have is what Jesus has done for me.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming back for another session. I'd like to welcome everyone here, everyone who is able to, to come here tonight, as well as the viewers on 3ABN. And I'd like to invite uh, Andrea Anderson up for prayer. Good evening and happy, I don't know if the sun set, but happy almost Sabbath. Uh, you, um, are you guys there? Happy <laughs> Sabbath? <laughs> okay, um, I am disappointed for those who are viewing via 3ABN, first off, because it's always great to fellowship together. But um, while everybody was sharing up here, oh my, I was so touch. Thank you so much for each one of you that um, shared a little bit about what um, inspired you to, yeah, choose this theme. Righteousness by faith is the theme of my life. Um, I love it. Um, it. It brings me so much joy and so much peace, and I want everybody to know it because I feel like not everybody does, so I love it. That's why I drove from Moses Lake to here. Um, to spend the weekend in Walla Walla with you guys. Uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Uh, I, you can kneel if you want. I'm going to kneel. You can do what you want um, right there. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege of worshiping you and experiencing your grace and your love and your, um, your amazing character. I thank you so much that there is nothing that we can do um, to gain our salvation. You say that all of our righteousness, all of the good stuff that we do and maybe even try so hard to do is like filthy rags before you. And I thank you so much that you offer us your robe of righteousness not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. Lord, I thank you um, for being here, for sending the Holy Spirit, and I just pray in a special way that he would flood this place. Lord, that he would flood our lives. You know um, every individual and what they're struggling with. Those that are in this room, Lord, those that we care about that are outside of this room, those that are still planning on coming, and those that are viewing, I don't know if I said that, but Lord, every person, you know where our struggles are, and I just pray um, that the power of Satan would be broken. Lord, we have no power on our own to break his power over us, but I ask that you would do this as a special gift for us tonight. I pray for your angels to encamp around this place, that no evil could come in. Lord, may we learn a message that will inspire not us just tonight, but for the rest of our lives. I um, ask a special anointing over Mr. Duffield as he gets up to share. Lord, may you hide him behind the cross. May he only speak your word. May you surprise him even with the way that he speaks. Lord, um, you tell us, well, Paul was at that I would speak as I ought. And Lord, I pray that that would be his experience, that he would speak, Lord, in such a way that you're honored. Thank you again for being with us and bless each person and the ones we love. Amen. Thank you, Andrea. And at this time, I would like to invite up again, Mr. Ron Duffield. Well, while we're, oh, it's there. Well, I feel like we could just go home right now and we would have been blessed this evening. By the way, that uh, reading that Travis read is from A.T. Jones' 18th sermon at the 1893 General Conference before an audience in the tabernacle of 3,600 Seventh-day Adventists. And when he got done, they broke out in a song. And for two hours, people stood up to praise the Lord. Well, tonight, we're going to look at the most important meeting now, I forgot to mention earlier that in my presentations, this is just a broad brush. There's so much that we could talk about on these subjects. So I'm just painting a broad brush, and I don't doubt that I'm missing things. 
But there's so many stories I'd like to tell, and I have to take this one out and that one out. Earlier this afternoon, we talked about why history is important, not only in the Bible, but also our own Adventist history. We talked about the early Advent movement, how doctrines were studied out, but then how the Laodicean, mess, the Laodicean condition came about in the church. Then we talked about uh, how God moved to make a change in the early 1880s there, how James White had had that burden along with Ellen White, but how he had stayed there in Battle Creek. But God made a promise even after he died that he would send others to take his place. And we see that that was fulfilled in the messengers. God, uh, Ellen White called them that. God called them that. Messengers of that teaching. So tonight we're going to look at the history of 1888. Now it's a very controversial subject. I don't want to add to that. But I do think it's important that we understand at least a little bit about what happened in that meeting. Now we're not here to decide who's going to heaven and who's not. We're not here to demean the leadership that uh, rose up against it. We should try to understand why so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. They actually thought they were defending the church from false doctrine. And they were conservatives. Well, I should be careful there, but what I'm saying <laughs> is that we all, I don't care where you are on the spectrum of Adventism, Laodiceanism is not only to one group. It doesn't say to the angel of the church of the liberals or to the angel of the church of the conservative. It says to the angel of the church of Laodicea. So we're all in need of Christ. So what else do I need to tell you? Um, we don't want to demean some of these pioneers. They did wonderful things for God. And we don't want to throw out all the good they did when we recognize that mistakes were made. So we better get going here. Um, Righteousness by faith is God's message for a dying world. Now, I want to look here first. Before we get to that meeting, I want to talk about a couple of things. And one is, I'm just going to run through very quickly several statements that show that the Laodicean remedies, which is gold robes, a robe, and eye salve, third angel's message, which is the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, Justification by faith, righteousness by faith, um, the righteousness of Christ, the message of Revelation 18.1, which is described as the loud cry of the third angel, um, and the latter rain, and the 1888 message, or the most precious message, as Ellen White described it, they're all talking about the same thing, and we need to see that it's really all the same foundational message of righteousness by faith. So in Revelation 18, this is a text that from early Advent days was looked at as that which described that final loud cry and the latter rain being poured out on the church to take a message to the world. So Revelation 18, 1 and 2 and 4 says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power or authority, and the earth was lightened or illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong or loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and you receive of her plague. So this is that final message to the church or to the world from the church to accept of God and to refuse the, the, uh, the doctrines of Babylon. So let's look at several statements Ellen White made. I'm just showing you how all of these messages really talk about the same thing. The message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. The Laodicean message has been sounding. Take this message in all its phases and sound it forth to the people wherever providence opens away. Justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ are the themes to be presented to a perishing world. Did you know the Laodicean message is for the world too? But how can we tell them about it if we're still poor, wretched, blind, and naked and haven't fully accepted and experienced that, the remedies God is offering? Oh, that you may open the door of your heart to Jesus. 
Another statement Ellen White made, these are all in the 1890s. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity or in truth. So when, we, when you talk about the third angel's message, you're talking about justification by faith. We need to make that clearer. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Ellen White made this statement in 1892. We're going to come back to that on Sunday. The sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the earth. So again, this is tied in with the loud cry, the latter rain. It's the righteousness of Christ. Said my guide, this was uh, a, a dream Ellen White had. There is much light to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message, understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit, will lighten the earth with its glory. It's the law and the gospel combined. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with power that will send the rays of the Son of Righteousness into all the highways and byways of life. And then this statement from 1896. Uh, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. So you see, it doesn't do away with the law. It actually makes them capable of keeping the commandments of God in the truest sense. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large maser. So that most precious message was the very message of Revelation 18 that was to go with a loud cry under the latter rain power. There's one other thing I want to touch on here before we actually get to the 1880 conference, and that is the idea of the latter rain. And sometimes I think we think of the latter rain as kind of just this nebulous power that God zaps upon that end time church, like this lightning strikes. But the latter rain really is something more than, yes, there's power, but it's not just a nebulous power. In the Bible, here's one text, Deuteronomy 32, 1 and 2, and here Moses is writing, uh, God speaking, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and as rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. Now, there's a lot of other texts that kind of give this idea. In other words, <clears throat> the reign of the Holy Spirit is not just power. It's power because it's truth and doctrine. Well, looking at Pentecost gives us an idea, too, how the, what the latter reign will be like. So we'll look at a couple statements here that Ellen White made about the early reign. The Savior knew that when the Holy Spirit should come upon the disciples in full measure, notice what happens. Their minds would be illuminated and they would fully understand the work before them and take it up just where Christ had left it. In other words, after three and a half years with Jesus, right before the cross, they didn't understand still. But after 10 days of prayer and confession and repentance and praying for that Holy Spirit, it was, the Holy Spirit was poured out and their minds were illuminated. That's where the power came from. When the Spirit was poured out from on high, the church was flooded with what? Light. But Christ was the source of that light. His name was on every tongue. His love filled every heart. So it will be when the angel that comes down from heaven, having great power, shall lighten the earth with his glory. So again, when we talk about the latter rain, we're not just talking about a nebulous power. We're actually talking about a motivation and a power that comes from a knowledge of Christ and his message to us personally that we can't help but share with others. One last statement here. When the mighty angel descends from heaven, clothed with the panoply of heaven and give strength to the third angel 
the power of the message is felt by them. The heavenly showers fall on them. The latter rain drops in their vessels. So again, the idea that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, is really the power of a message and the illumination of our minds to understand. Well, in 1882, from after the time that Ellen White was healed, after James White had died, she, that her emphasis on what was coming on the, on the louder rain and the loud cry increased. If you look at all of her statements um, after 1882, you'll notice this. We're going to look at just one statement here she made in 82. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. We have far more to fear, she said, from within than from without. The hindrance to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. So in 1882, she's, she's stating we have more, they had more to fear from within than from without at that time. There is nothing that Satan fears so much <clears throat> as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. Sorry here. <clears throat> when the way is prepared, the spirit of, <clears throat> for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come, and Satan will, can no more hinder a shower of blessing from descending upon God's people, then he can close the windows of heaven that rain cannot come upon the earth. Praise God, Satan cannot stop it. Now there is a work for us to do. It's not in making our own righteousness, but as we will see through the rest of this weekend, there is a way that we can prepare, and that is by coming to Christ and recognizing our great need. Well, now to the summer of 1888. Ellen White had gone to Europe for two years, 85 to 87. And in 88, she came back home to her place there in Hillsburg. But after she came home, she had, uh, <clears throat> during the summer of 88, she had a very impressive dream. And this is how she describes it. I was in an assembly when a man of noble, majestic stature came in and took his position on the platform and unrolled something which looked like several long leaves fastened together. And as he turned the pages, his hand ran down the page and his eyes swept over the congregation as he turned them from right to left and I could see what was on them. So she sees this uh, being standing there and unrolling this scroll and going through the scroll. And what did she see? Well, I saw there different names and characters and sins that were written down. There were sins of every description, selfishness, envy, pride, jealousy, evil, surmising, hypocrisy, licentiousness, hatred, and murder in the heart because of this envy and jealousy. These sins were right among the ministers and the people, and page after page was turned. So this is quite a dream that she's having in the summer of, of 1888, and what, what does this mean? She, so she asks, well, what... How was this? And a voice said that the time had come when the work in heaven is all activity for the inhabitants of this world. The time had come when the temple and its worshipers had to be measured. So she's quoting there, or, this, or the, the voice is quoting from Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. There was this measuring that was going to take place or taking place. This is what I saw, and I woke up and found myself sitting up in bed with great drops of perspiration on my brow, and I felt paralyzed. Ellen White actually thought she was going to die. She got sick again, and she really thought this was it, summer of 1888. And I'm going to take just a moment for water. Thank you. I'm not used to talking this much. Well, the dream impressed Ellen Weiss so much that she actually wrote a letter to all those that were going to gather at the Minneapolis conference. And I should add that she had another dream similar to this a few years later where a, a being was standing at the door of a building measuring the worshipers and those that 
were to come in. And there was two things that were being asked. Do you have the Holy Spirit? And do you have the wedding garment on? I think that's what she was seeing here. And the concern was that there was all this sin being uh, shown. So she wrote to those that were going to gather at Minneapolis, and she said, we are impressed that this gathering will be the most important meeting you have ever attended. All selfish ambition should be laid aside, and you should plead with God for his spirit to descend upon you as it came upon the disciples who were assembled together upon the day of Pentecost. So what was she saying there? This is such an important meeting. We should be praying for the latter rain like the disciples were praying for Pentecost. Well, on October 2, uh, Ellen White was healed because of the prayers of others. And she boarded a train from California and headed east to Minneapolis. And uh, she arrived there on um, October 10. And the Ministerial Institute began that day or that evening. And then it, that Ministerial Institute, which is where they would do a lot of Bible study and so forth, went on for seven days. And then they would start the regular business meetings along with other religious meetings in the evening and so forth. And Ellen White would uh, talk at Minneapolis 20, over close to 20 times. And only, uh, 15 of those lectures or talks were recorded and we can still read them today. So we're going to look at a, some things that she said. Now this is the first day, the next morning, October 11, and this is what Ellen White said when she presented to those gathered there. And by the way, these are all the leaders of the church. God's intent was take a message to the leadership of the church and from there to the entire world church and to the world. This is what Ellen White said on that first day. Now, as we have assembled here, we want to make the most of our time. But we too often let opportunities slip away and we do not realize the benefit from them which we should. If ever we needed the Holy Ghost to be with us, if ever we needed to preach in the demonstration of the Spirit, it is at this very time. The baptism of the Holy Ghost will come upon us at this very meeting, if we will have it so. Let us commence right here in this meeting and not wait until the meeting is half through. We want the Spirit of God here now. We need it, and we want it to be revealed in our characters. Well, the next day, October 12, she said, Now, brethren, I have felt one of the most solemn burdens ever since I have returned from Europe. And I will tell you, as I told my friends in Oakland, I feel horribly afraid to come into this conference. Why did you so afraid? Well, she tells them, I've been awake night after night with a sense of agony for the people of God. That the sweat would roll off for me, some things fearfully impressive were presented to me. And then she tells them the story of the dream she had about the being being there and measuring the temple and those who worship therein. Well, why was there all the controversy going on there? Well, an issue had come up over the law in Galatians, and some of you may be familiar with this, but Galatians 3.24 states, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now the old pioneers, because of all the opposition from other Protestant churches saying that the Ten Commandments were done away with, and that the Sabbath was not binding any longer, would use this text to prove that the Ten Commandments were done away with. So the response from pioneers was, no, this text is only talking about the ceremonial law. The schoolmaster is the ceremonial law. Well, Jones and Wagner came along, and they started in 86 saying, no, the, the schoolmaster is primarily the Ten Commandments, which leads us to Christ. And because of that difference... There was this controversy, so much difference that Butler felt like the church was being torn apart and he actually got physically sick and had to stay home. But he, he was well enough to write a 30-page letter to Ellen White and he really let her have it. It's, you can still read his letter to her today. He was very upset. Well, Ellen White on that, uh, the 14th of October wrote back to Butler 
And this is what she said. The spirit and influence of the ministers generally who have come to this meeting is to discard light. From this night's work, there will arise false imaginings, cruel and unjust misunderstandings that will work like leaven in every church and close hearts to the striving of the Spirit of God. The influence of this meeting, she says, will be as far-reaching as eternity. That's how important this gathering was. Well, how was it that there was this spirited of eight right there in Minneapolis? Well, when everyone arrived, there was a blackboard up at the front of the church. And on that blackboard, J.H. Morrison, he was the conference president, president from Iowa, he had wrote, resolved that the law in Galatian is a ceremonial law, and then he signed his name. And then he wrote, resolved that the law in Galatians is the moral law, and he put a blank there, and Wagner was supposed to sign it. But Wagner refused to sign it, and he said, the point of the Galatian is stating that it's not our righteousness, it's not righteousness by the law that can save us, but faith alone, whether it be the moral or the ceremonial law. So he refused to sign that blackboard. Well, J.H. Morrison, there's uh, an interesting story that uh, came to light from G.B. Starr. He spent 10 years with Ellen White in Australia. And while he was in Australia, he told Ellen White this story of what had happened just a few years before 1888 in this state of Iowa. One morning, as four of us were in the tent at Oskaloosa, Iowa, this other minister, J.H. Morrison, was walking about the tent. A stranger entered the tent. He appeared to me as one of the finest looking men I'd ever seen. He was over six feet tall, well proportioned, and had such a kindly expression on his face. So the minister, J.H. Morrison, invited him to be seated, and the two of us men listened with interest to the conversation. So G.B. Starr and another minister sat there and listened to this stranger talk with J.H. Morrison. At first, the minister, J.H. Morrison, replied to the stranger's question in a kindly spirit. But soon he assumed a debating, controversial attitude. We saw no reason for this, as the stranger manifested such a good, sweet spirit of interest, inquiry, and often offered no objections. After about an hour of such conversation, the stranger arose in all his dignity, and addressing J.H. Morrison, he said, You are no minister of Jesus Christ. You are a controversialist, sir. Well, instead of the minister realizing that he had been properly rebuked, he instead chuckled and he laughed and he said, oh, you can't meet the argument. The stranger made no reference to this, but repeated again, word for word, his statement. Again, the minister laughed, and a third time the stranger repeated, you are no minister of Jesus Christ. You are a controversialist, sir. I bid you good day. And out of the tent door, he walked. Well, when G.B. Starr told this to Ellen White, uh, this is what she said. Well, I'm sorry, when Brother Starr told Ellen White this story years after the Minneapolis conference, this was her response. Why, Brother Starr, that was an angel of God, Sister White said. Was it? I inquired. How did you know? How did I know why I gave that message to that brother at the Minneapolis conference and I told him the Lord had sent an angel to rebuke him for his controversial manner of labor. And that was the same kind of spirit, though, that was at Minneapolis. In fact, it, it became very mean. There was considerable heckling of Wagner and Jones. Though E.J. Wagner was short, he could be plainly heard. However, because of his stature, someone called out tauntingly, we can't see you. The thrust was made to hurt him, and it did, and there's a whole story behind that. He was probably a little over five foot tall. But when he had graduated from medical school and got into Battle Creek, 
he felt that he was being discriminated against because of his height, and he was complaining about that. This was early on in the 1870s. And Ellen White had actually written to him and rebuked him for that attitude. And th that testimony was printed in Testimonies Volume 4. And uh, in that small, uh, when there's only 27,000 Adventists in the whole world, people know who Ellen White was probably writing to, even though his name wasn't there. So I believe when, when he was preaching at Minneapolis, they did that, they said that just to taunt him. And it hurt him because it was meant to. Well, another situation came up where J.H. Uh, uh, Morrison would, would preach very debatingly. By the way, Ellen White would get off, up off the front seat and leave when J.H. Morrison preached. And when Wagner was preaching, she would sit there and say amen. But after J.H. Morrison pre presented his uh, talk, Jones and Wagner got up and all they did was take their Bibles up to the front and they read text after text, 16 of them, and then they sat down. This is what um, R.T. Nash says, who was there. This was the only answer, and without a word of comment, they took their seats. During the entire time of the readings, there was a hushed stillness over the vast assembly. I think because they saw the contrast. Well, Ellen White's response. I read this earlier this afternoon. When Brother Wagner brought out these ideas, the matchless charms of Christ in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, accepting the conversation between myself and my husband. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. Ellen White recognized this is the promise God gave me when my husband died. He would send others with this same burden that was on my heart and my husband's heart. Well, there was a problem too, and that was because Ellen White sat there and said amen to this. It brought her into a very poor light amongst some of the brethren. Mrs. White's uh, attitude and words at the time, it was plain, or from, the from the Mrs. White's attitude and words at the time, it was plain. She stood 100% with Jones and Wagner in the message they were presenting at the general conference, and that brought then criticism against her. It went that far. Well, now we're going to go back to the Ministerial Institute, and this is day six. And Ellen White write this, writes or speaks this before the people gathered there. It is high time that we would awake out of sleep, that we seek the Lord with all our heart. I know he will be found of us. I know that all heaven is at our command. Just as soon as we love God with all our hearts, and our neighbors as ourselves, God will work through us. How shall we stand in the time of the latter rain, she asks. Who expects to have a part in the first resurrection? You who have been cherishing sin and iniquity in the heart, you will fail in that day. She's pleading with them. How are we going to stand? If this is how we act when the latter rain is being poured out, are we going to do well in that day? No. Now, G.B. Starr writes uh, a couple years later, this is what he said. Sister White says that we have been in the time of the latter rain since the Minneapolis meetings. There's several other, I could share several other statements that show that's absolutely true. This was the time of the latter rain. God was ready to pour out his spirit on his people at that meeting. It was my privilege to attend the general conference at Minneapolis, Minnesota. There, the subjects of righteousness by faith were emphasized as it had never been emphasized or never been before among SDA ministers. This is GB Starr again. Sister White was present, and on a day, and, and daily she threw influence in decided words with the presentations of this subject. She stated that this marked the beginning of the latter rain and the loud cry of the third angel's message. So this was openly being stated to those that would listen there at Minneapolis. Well, the end of the Ministerial Institute came and the general conference began on uh, October 17. And the next morning on October 18, Ellen White spoke these words, brethren and sisters, there is a great need at this time of humbling ourselves before God that the Holy Spirit may come upon us. May God help us that his spirit may be manifest among us. We should not wait until we go home to obtain the blessing of heaven. 
Those who have been long in the work have been far too content to wait for the showers of the latter rain to revive them. Don't go home. It can happen now, is what Ellen White was saying. Then October 19, <clears throat> the next day, she says, we should seek to have our actions of such a character that we will not shrink from having our Savior look upon them. Christ is here this morning. Angels are here. And they are, what are they doing? Measuring the temple of God and those that worship therein. She's stating that very thing that she saw in that dream that summer that troubled her so much. She's trying to impress them with the importance of this meeting. The history of this meeting will be carried up to God for a record of every meeting is made. The spirit manifested, the words spoken, and the actions performed are noted in the books of heaven. Every thing is transferred to the records as faithfully as are our features to the polished plate of the artist. October 20. Here I want to tell you what a terrible thing it is if God gives light and it is impressed on your heart and spirit for you to do as the Jews did. God will withdraw his spirit unless his truth is accepted. That's how serious this was. October 24, this was the last sermon she gave. Ten days before the conference was over, she, that was the last time she spoke. Now our meeting is drawing to a close, and not one confession has been made. There has not been a single break so that to let the Spirit of God in. Now I was saying, what was the use of our assembling here together and for our ministering brethren to come in if they are here only to shut out the Spirit of God from the people? What is the reason the Spirit of God does not come into our meetings? It is because we have built a barrier around us. I speak decidedly because I want you to realize where you are standing. It was her plea. She pled with the people there. Well, several other ministers that were there talk about what happened then because of this Ellen White supporting the message. And actually that last night, the 24th of, of October, she actually planned to leave. She's figured, why should I stay here if no one listens to what I'm saying? An angel showed her that night, you need to stay. This is what G.B. Sars said. It was our privilege to attend this meeting and daily to listen to Sister White as she un qualifiedly endorsed the powerful and convincing presentations of this vital subject from the book of Romans and Galatians. Never were clearer proofs given to the assembly that the Lord was speaking through the spirit of prophecy. Morning after morning, Sister White would reveal the words and conversations of individuals spoken in their private compartments. What were they saying when they went home in the evening. Well, this is what F.H. Westfall says. It was, it, I will relate what I remember of the 188 General Conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It rings in my ears still how Sister White earnestly appealed to the conference to accept the message of justification by faith. By the way, this was written in 1930, 42 years later, and it still was ringing in his ears. She said that she was carried in vision from room to room where the delegates were located in Minneapolis and she heard their conversation and ridicule of the message of justification by faith. They said that Sister White was growing old, getting childish, and that the young men, Jones and Wagner, had her under their thumb and had influenced her to uphold them in what they were teaching not true. She had never heard them speak until Minneapolis. And she recognized it because of what she had talked about with her husband eight years before. C.C. Uh, McReynolds, this is what he reports, 1931. In our lodging house, we were hearing a good many remarks about Sister White favoring Elder Wagner and he was one of, that he was one of her pets. The spirit of controversy was up, and when the delegates came in from the last meeting of the day, there was simple babble. 
with much laughter and joking and some very disgusting comments were being made, no spirit of solemnity prevailing. A few did not engage in the hilarity, no worship hour was kept, and anything but the solemnity that should have been felt and manifested on such an occasion was present. So here's Ellen White speaking during the day, pleading with people, the latter rain, God wants to pour out his spirit upon us. And in the evening and the night, there was ridicule and, and criticism being spoken. Well, this is how Ellen White describes it. I never felt more decidedly the spirit of the Lord moving upon me than at that meeting. And I know the angel of the Lord was standing by my side to help me. I seem to live as in clear light of the Son of Righteousness, but the spirit that prevailed at that meeting was not the Spirit of God. I had to bear a decided testimony against the spirit that prevailed. But notice, my testimony was treated with indifference as idle tales. Incredible. In fact, the talk was that what Jones and Wagner were teaching at Minneapolis was undermining Ellen White's writings. And yet, as they were trying to defend the church from the teachings that they felt undermined her writings, they themselves were undermining her them, themselves. Again, all of this is a warning to us. Can, is it possible that we can do the same thing today? I was charged with being influenced by my son, W.C. White, Elder A.T. Jones, and E.J. Wagner. For a while, W.C. White actually had to separate himself from his mom in helping her, obviously after his dad died, because that criticism was so great. I shall never <clears throat> think, I shall never, I think, be called to stand under the direction of the Holy Spirit as I stood at Minneapolis, Ellen White says. The presence of Jesus was with me. All assembled in that meeting had an opportunity to place themselves on the side of truth by receiving the Holy Spirit, which was sent by God in such rich currents of love and mercy. But in the rooms occupied by some of our people was heard ridicule, criticism, jeering and laughter and then this is incredible to me the manifestations of the Holy Spirit were attributed to fanaticism so here's the Holy Spirit manifesting himself in his church and being identified with as if it was fanaticism again uh, a warning for us today. So Ellen White was told after her dream, or after she planned to leave, and then she had a dream that she needed to stay there for the re remainder of the conference. In fact, the angel told her, this is why I raised you up off your sickbed in California, was to come to this meeting you can't leave your post of duty. You need to stay. This is what she says. From this meeting, decisions will be made for life. And I think I just, did I lose? Okay. For life or death. Not that anyone need be to perish, but spiritual pride and self-confidence will close the door that Jesus and his Holy Spirit's power shall not be admitted. And thank God for this next sentence. They shall have another chance. And I tell you, that's the good news about this sad history, is that God didn't just walk away. And that chance is still going on today, 2017, 100 and what, 26 years later, 27 years later. Another chance to be undeceived and to repent. Confess their sins and come to Christ and be converted that he shall heal them. 
Well, Alan White summarized in several different places. In fact, there's um, four volumes that were finally released in uh, 1987, which have a lot of these statements in them that prior to that time had not been readily available. And as you go through those four volumes, you will find time after time when Ellen White describes this, the time that she had there at Minneapolis and, and what it represented to her, uh, overall to her experience that she had gone through her whole life. This meeting has been the saddest experience of my life. One time she even compared uh, what took place there to bringing her more pain than the death of her husband. It's how much of a, uh, an impact it had on her because she recognized this was something that God wanted to bring to his people so that they could all go home. The position and work God gave me at that conference was disregarded by nearly all. Rebellion was popular. Their course was an insult to the Spirit of God. So it's possible that we as human beings can actually ins insult the Holy Spirit to the point that the Holy Spirit has to withdraw for a time at least. And then perhaps to me one of the saddest statements found in any of the Spirit of Prophe Prophecy writings is this one. Uh, 1888, where she says this, Christ was wounded in the house of his friends. She's quoting from Zechariah 13.6, and she stated this in the context of what happened there at Minneapolis. Now, I haven't personally counted, but there are, there are others who have said, as they've you know, read through and, and kept, a, kept ca account, that over a hundred times Ellen White compared the treatment of the Holy Spirit or of Christ coming there to Minneapolis, she compared that to the treatment that the Jews inflicted on Christ when he came the first time. I, I think if we grasp the magnitude of what that means, it would truly affect our thinking about our own heritage as, as Seventh-day Adventists. We're not condemning our fathers in the sense of judging their future, like I said. But if we fail to acknowledge what happened there, we will continue to repeat the same mistakes generation after generation after generation. In fact, I have collected statements from numerous books that have been printed since the 1920s that in an attempt to lessen the gravity of what took place there have tried to make it out as a overall victory. Now, yes, God was good and we can praise him for that. But to, to depict it the meeting where righteousness, justification by faith was made fun of and scoffed at is only perpetuating us into a whole new generation of repeating the same mistakes. If we tell our young people today in our colleges, in the few classes that they might take on Adventist history, that 1888 overall was a grand victory, we are actually guaranteeing that another generation is going to have to come until we acknowledge, not, we're not responsible for the guilt that took place there, but if we don't acknowledge that what happened was an insult to the Holy Spirit, then we're not recognizing, oh, I could do the same thing today. So when God sends the same message today to prepare people to go out to the world, is it possible for me to say, oh, that's fanaticism, or that doesn't line up with what I think, therefore, I'm going to rise up against it. We might even, be think we're, might even think we're defending the church. 
And like I said earlier, this was a group of conservative Seventh-day Adventist pioneers, by and large. Well, there were differences of opinion about 1888. And by the way, I don't want to paint the picture that it was all dark because there were many that came away rejoicing. W.C. White puts it this way, the delegates at the close of the meeting carried away very different impressions. Many felt that it was one of the most profitable meetings that they had ever attended. And G.B. Starr and McReynolds and R.T. Nash, W.W. Prescott, even John Harvey Kellogg was converted there at that conference. Now some of those people later turned around and fought against it. Some who actually fought against it at the time through God's mercy came around and, and supported it and uh, took it to the world. Here is uh, F.H. Westfall. This is what is stated about him. The message at Minneapolis became most precious to the heart of Westfall. It was sweet music to my soul, he declared. He went back to Plainfield, Wisconsin, and he told the church that the latter rain had started. As a result, one farmer sold his farm, put much of his money into the Lord's work, took up canvassing, and was finally ordained to the ministry. And so you had this, this difference. And by the way, those two differences still exist to this day. Two rivers of thought came out of Minneapolis. Some of them said this was a beautiful message, but we did not accept it in its fullness like we should have. Others came away thinking this was a terrible conference. Um, after all, Jones and Wagner had a bad attitude and these kind of things have been magnified to the point where there's a lot of confusion about what took place then. Now I will say that, that some of the ministers uh, did repent and we praise the Lord for that. Uriah Smith apologized later, repented for his opposition to Ellen White. But the sad thing is that even when he, he went to his death still believing that Minneapolis was the worst thing that ever happened when the idea that the moral law was the schoolmaster. He still felt to his dying days that that was a terrible thing, even though Ellen White had written to him very clearly that in uh, 1896, that the moral law was especially being referred to when it came to that schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So Ellen White, even at Minneapolis, though she didn't come out openly there, later on would confirm this is truth for us as a people. And yet some, though they repented to a degree, never fully would uh, receive that message. Now, again, I'm, I'm not saying we don't, we're not deciding heaven or hell. That's not our job. But we can, we can identify what happened there and say, Lord, help us not to repeat this. Well, it's an interesting statement that Ellen White made at Minneapolis during her last sermon. She said this as she faced the ministers gathered there. Now this is the last ministers meeting we will have unless you wish to meet together yourselves. If the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they may receive it. And tomorrow, thankfully, we will look at what happened when the message went to the people. And you know where God's, you know where God started? He went to an academy. And there was revival. So when I see tonight a group of young people standing up here talking about what righteousness by faith means to them, I say, praise God. Amen. We need a new generation to do 
what the past generations have failed to do. And this is what I mean by do. To recognize that we are but dust, as Seth Roberts read, and finally recognize that the only hope we have to keep that law is to allow Jesus Christ and his righteousness to be written in our heart today. I hope that this weekend will be a start for some of you to recognize that righteousness by faith is at the very foundation of our church, even if you haven't heard it in your growing up years. It's a core of our message, even though we have failed many times to present it clearly. And God is calling you to accept that Holy Spirit in your lives, to let the power of God transform you so that you can go tell the world what they're missing out on. But if all you have is a theory, that doesn't convince anyone until you can say, well, I may not understand all the theological concepts around this, and I may not use all the big words, but I do know this, that God can transform me, and here's, I can tell you how he did it. This is what I used to be, and this is how God has changed me, and yes, I'm still struggling with this, but guess what? I know that God can help me in those areas too. Well, tomorrow morning, we're going to look at the simple story of the cross. I would encourage you tonight as you go home to plead with the Lord to continue to bless this conference and to also bless each of us here, especially the young people, that they would grasp the importance of this message. And I hope that you will see the value and the power that there is in our history. What I shared tonight, to me, is terribly sad. And I hope I did not present it in in just a negative way. It's not about condemning our pioneers. But God help us, let's not make the same mistake today. Let us not, in our attempts to protect God's church, end up fighting against the very thing he wants to use to transform us as a people. Would you kneel with me as we ask the Lord to bless us? Father, I just thank you that you kept an account of our history. Lord, not so that we can rise up and throw rocks at our forefathers, but Lord, so that, that we will recognize how sinful humanity really is and how terribly mistaken we can be. Lord, I pray that you will empower the young people that have gathered here. Show them, Lord, yes, their weakness, their nothingness with him, the power that you are so much waiting to pour upon this church, not in just nebulous power, but in an illumination of our minds to understand the message of righteousness by faith as you intend us to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.